This is a page from the ancient biblical manuscript known as the Leningrad Codex. And what you're looking at is the end of the book of Eka, or Lamentations, as it is titled in English Bibles. This final verse here is considered so dour or depressing that it is traditional when it is read as part of a liturgy that one is to reread the preceding verse just to avoid ending on such a down note. Now, what we're going to try and do is work out what the author of this text was trying to say to their readers. And before we walk through a translation of this verse, Let's begin with some context. The Book of Lamentations is anonymous, although traditionally the prophet Jeremiah has been considered the author. But far more important to the meaning of the text than the author is the historical situation. The Book of Lamentations is written as a reaction to the fall of Jerusalem around the year 586 BC. The author was likely an eyewitness to this event and the book was written very much in the same tone and style as the book of Jeremiah. So for our purposes, we will proceed with the assumption that the prophet Jeremiah was indeed the author. In the years leading up to the fall of Jerusalem, the kingdom of Judah was a vassal state of the Babylonian Empire, ruled by King Nebuchadnezzar II. And in the year 601 BC, the Babylonians attempted to invade Egypt and failed. Jehoiakim, king of Judah stopped paying tribute to Nebuchadnezzar and allied himself with Egypt. And then in the year 597, Nebuchadnezzar laid siege to Jerusalem to quell this little rebellion. And the siege lasted about four months. Jehoiakim died, and his son Jehoiakim became king. Jerusalem surrendered. The king and 10,000 others were deported to Babylon. And Nebuchadnezzar took Mataniah, Jehoiakim's uncle, and changed his name to Zedekiyahu and installed him as king of Judah. But he also rebelled against the Babylonians by allying himself with Egypt and stopping the paying of tribute. So the Babylonians besieged Jerusalem a second time. This time, the siege lasted two and a half years. And in the late summer of 586 BC, the Babylonian army entered Jerusalem. Those that had not succumbed to starvation and disease were either executed or taken captive to Babylon. Zedekiahu tried to escape but he was captured. He was taken before the Babylonian king, Nebuchadnezzar. Zedekiah, whose family, was executed in front of him. Then his eyes were gouged out, so that, that would be the last thing that he saw. Then he was bound with chains and taken to Babylon. Jerusalem was plundered and burned. The Babylonian general, Nebuzaradan, oversaw the dismantling of the city walls and Yahweh's temple, reducing the city of Jerusalem to rubble. The prophet Jeremiah was in the city of Jerusalem during all of these events. He warned that this destruction was coming. He proclaimed that this event was the inevitable result of the people of Judah forsaking Yahweh as their God and breaking the covenant that they had with him. So the book of Lamentations is the prophet Jeremiah's reaction to witnessing all of these traumatic events. In Hebrew, the title of the book is Eka which comes from the first word of the first verse. The book is a set of five songs, each of which is essentially a funeral song, whereas a requiem or a eulogy is more about remembrance and a memorializing of the dead. These songs are an expression of pure sorrow and grief, so more of a dirge. The literary genre of a lamentation over the destruction of a city can be found across the ancient Near East, as well as elsewhere in the prophetic literature of the Bible. A general common motif that is present in this literature is that the event is described in terms of both the terrestrial and celestial realms. That is to say, this literature is not just a description of human suffering, but it is theological in nature. An example from outside the Bible of this genre is this lamentation over the fall of the city of Ur at the hands of the Elamite army. Although this took place more than 1,400 years before the events described in the Book of Lamentations, it is a good example of how this literature works. In this lament, Enlil, the chief deity of the Mesopotamian pantheon, and the Anunnaki, which was like a council of deities that governed the world, they had decreed that the city of Ur was to be destroyed. And most of this lament is Ningle pleading with Enlil and the Anunnaki to reverse their decision and spare her from having to go into exile, which is what the destruction of her temple in the city would mean. And interspersed throughout Ningle's pleading is descriptions of the desolation 
of the city of Ur. So you have both a description of terrestrial events, that is, an invading army destroying a city, and the description of the drama that is unfolding in the celestial realm of the divine court. Two parallel descriptions of the same event. You find this pattern of dual descriptions in the city laments in the Bible. In Lamentations chapter 5, you have the terrestrial description of the tragedy of the suffering of the people of Jerusalem, and in the celestial realm you have the prophet Jeremiah as representative of Jerusalem and the nation of Judah pleading in Yahweh's divine court. So in the terrestrial realm, the destruction of Jerusalem is an earthly king quelling a rebellion in his territory. But what is really going on is what is happening in the celestial realm. There it is Yahweh enthroned as king, pronouncing judgment, rejecting the people of Judah for their rebellion against him. Jeremiah pleads with Yahweh. Remember, O Yahweh, what has become of us. Take note and see our disgrace. The crown has fallen from our head. Woe to us, for we have sinned. You, O Yahweh, will sit forever on your throne for generation to generation. Why have you forgotten us forever? Why do you forsake us for so long? Restore us to you, O Yahweh, that we will be restored. Renew our days as of old. Unless you have utterly rejected us. Unless you are angry with us beyond measure. Now, returning to our manuscript, here we read, Ki im maos maastanu, katsavta alenu ad maod. The first two words of this verse are both conjunctions, meaning they indicate a logical relationship between what follows and what preceded them. A double conjunction like this is a little bit awkward to turn into coherent English. This first word, ki, can mean something like that, for, when, or even because. And the second, im, indicates a conditional relationship, so something like if or unless. Now, the meaning of this verse hangs on how we understand the way that these two conjunctions are working together. So we're going to translate the rest of this verse and then return to these two initial particles here. All right, moving on, we have maos maastanu. And here we have a repetition of the verb maas, meaning to reject. This form of the first verb is called the call infinite absolute. The second is a call perfect second person masculine singular. And it has the first person plural pronoun as a suffix. And there's really no good way to turn this into English without adding extra words. The infinite absolute here is technically a verbal noun. So a straight literal translation would be something like rejection. You rejected us. What this doubling of the verb is meant to convey is that the action of the verb is emphatic. In English, we do this by modifying a verb with adjectives like completely, utterly, or absolutely. For now, we'll just stick with a simple literal translation. Then we have kasafta, which is a verb from the root kasaf, meaning to be wroth, or in more contemporary English, to become angry, as a noun wrath or rage. And it is in the call perfect second person masculine singular. So, you became angry. Then we have alenu, which is the preposition ail, and the first person plural pronoun, nu. And ail can mean a great many things, but since we're talking about anger here, we'll go with the simple with us as a translation. Then we have ad ma'od. Ad is a preposition, which means as far as or until, and ma'od is a noun meaning force, extremity, or abundance. Together like this, we can go with the literal to a great degree, or as an adjective, exceedingly. So what we have is two clauses, which we can render, you have completely rejected us, and you were exceedingly angry with us. Now, returning to our initial two conjunctions of this verse, just looking at each of these particles mechanically, the first one tells us that what follows is a subordinate clause meaning verse 22 modifies what was said in verse 21. And the second particle implies a conditional state. Now, looking through the academic literature on Hebrew syntax and on this verse in particular, there are many possible ways of understanding and translating these two words, which can more or less be boiled down to three possibilities, the others being variations of one of these three. First is simply rendering this with the word because. 
This makes the relationship between verse 21 and 22 causative. So this is the why of this. This ignores the second particle. The reason for this is that this is pretty much how ancient translations handle this verse. And there are a few Hebrew manuscripts that actually are missing the im. But the vast majority of the manuscript evidence and the consensus of the majority of scholars leans in the direction that the Masoretic text that we're looking at here is indeed correct. So the im is actually supposed to be there. But it's important to recognize this as one of the possibilities. The second option is the more literal rendering of even if. With this one, the poet is expressing his feelings of hopelessness with these statements, and he is asking that Yahweh restore the nation in spite of this. So restore us, even if you have completely rejected us and are angry with us beyond measure. So this is a kind of, I know it's likely hopeless, but can you restore us anyways type of thing. The third option makes use of an English word that both denotes a subordinate and conditional clause, and that is the word unless. With this option, the poet is saying restore us unless these conditions are met, in which case, don't bother, it's hopeless. Because simply, if these conditions are met, there is no point in asking for restoration. For if this is the case, reconciliation of the nation to their God is indeed hopeless. And there is no point at all at even asking. After looking at the academic arguments for each of these possibilities, there wasn't one that I considered more convincing than the others. The best I can do is say that these two are slightly more probable than the other one, but any of these would be reasonably considered a good translation. Now, you may say this is just splitting hairs or we're straining at the gnat and swallowing the camel. Well, Maybe. But these are the kinds of questions that translators and those who want to know what the author was trying to say have to wrestle with. Given that the theological message of the book is that Jerusalem's destruction at the hands of the Babylonian army was not Yahweh being defeated by the Babylonian gods, but that Yahweh is indeed king, and all of this suffering and destruction is the result of the people of Judah rebelling against Yahweh their king. The Babylonian army is just the instrument of God's justice in this story. So there is no plea for the Babylonians to be merciful. God is the offended party here, and only God can institute reconciliation and restoration. So with this passage, Mr. Jeremiah is asking the readers to contemplate the question, has God rejected his people completely? And will he be angry with them forever? Or is their hope that there will be reconciliation at some point in the future. So when it comes to this verse, if I was forced to come up with a translation, for a strict formal equivalent translation, I would go with even if. And if I was going for a more dynamic equivalent translation, I'd go with something like unless. But if I was simply trying to convey the general sense of what the author was trying to say, I would opt for a paraphrase that rewords verse 22, has questions. And this is exactly what the New Living Translation does, rendering this passage, But Lord, you remain the same forever. Your throne continues from generation to generation. Why do you continue to forget us? Why have you abandoned us for so long? Restore us, O Lord, and bring us back to you again. Give us back the joys we once had. Or... Have you utterly rejected us? Are you angry with us still? In this passage, Jeremiah is acknowledging that whether or not God reconciles with his people is entirely up to him. There is nothing that the people could possibly do about it. He pleads for God to bring restoration. Although he himself had prophesied that in the future God would make a new covenant with his people, in that moment, though, Jeremiah may have felt like that was nothing more than a remote hope for a distant future. Looking at the ruins of the city of Jerusalem, Jeremiah likely felt like it was hopeless. He was wondering, is this it? Is this the end? It's all gone now. There's nothing left. Last one out, turn out the lights. Likewise, it is the same when considering the estrangement of humans from God. Just like in Jeremiah's day, the people were expelled from Jerusalem Humanity has been expelled from the presence of God in Eden. 
and all humans are absolutely powerless to do anything about it. Either God reconciles with humanity, or there is no salvation, and there is absolutely nothing anyone can do about it. In the Gospels, there is the story about a man that came to Jesus asking, What do I have to do to be saved? Jesus talks with him for a bit and finds out that the man had obeyed the law since he was young, and God had blessed him with wealth and political authority. But Jesus told him that he was still lacking, and the man went away sad. Jesus' disciples were confused and frustrated by this and asked Jesus, Who in the world can be saved then? Tis hora dunatai sothenai. Literally, who therefore can possibly be saved? And Jesus' answer was, No one. It's impossible. Para anthropois tuto a dunatan s ten. By humans, this not possible is. Now I imagine Jesus paused there for a moment to let that statement sink in before he continued with para di theo panta dunata. By God, everything possible. The answer to the man's question of what must I do to be saved is there is nothing you can do. It is the same human powerlessness and helplessness that Jeremiah is expressing. If there is to be any salvation or restoration, it comes down to God himself. And the answer to, have you utterly rejected us? Are you angry with us still? The answer to this question is given explicitly and definitively throughout the Bible and even in the book of Lamentations itself. You can even say that the Bible itself is the answer to that question. That is the answer for both the question in regard to Jerusalem and the nations of Judah and Israel, as well as in regard to the situation of all humanity. In both cases, it is God that is the offended party. If he does not forgive, then there is no forgiveness to be had. If he does not restore us, then there is no possibility of restoration for humanity. It is indeed hopeless. We are all at his mercy, whether we like it or not. Although I'm tempted to put some of the thousands of passages that answer this question up on the screen for you, I think since the author of Lamentation saw fit to end this work on this verse, it would be appropriate for us to leave it there and contemplate the realization that there is nothing anyone can do to reverse the consequences of their own sin. Either God forgives and restores, or he doesn't. There's nothing anyone can do about it. Salvation cannot be attained. Either he gives the gift of salvation, or there is none.